Kitco News, special coverage of the Explore Convention, is brought to you by Radisson Mining. Dealmaking Sabanya Steelwater announced one of its biggest transactions in the battery metal space with Ioneer, which is advancing its Rye Light Ridge Lithium project in Nevada. Sabanya, the world's primary producer of platinum with a 10 billion market cap, is now focusing on metals that will matter during energy transition. Sabanya will contribute 490 million to become a joint venture in Rye Light. Executive Chairman of Ioneer is James Calloway. James, welcome Hi. to Kiko. Hi, it's great to be with you, and uh, it's an exciting time for our company. Well, let's get into it. Uh, James, you retired from Lithium Giant Orocobre in 2016. Right. What would you bullet point at Rye Light, which makes it such a good place to spend your retirement? <laughs> well, my, I'm not really retired, but uh, I did retire from, <laughs> from, from being the chairman of Orocobre. Uh, you know, uh, that experience, those eight years starting from a tiny little company and building an operating business, with the great team at Oracobre taught me a lot of lessons about what was important and what's not important in the, in the industry. And, you know, practical experience counts. And uh, I'm one of the few people that have could say they're working on their second project, uh, not their first. And uh, what's exciting about Riley Ridge, many things. Uh, first of all, you noted it's in the United States. It's, it's, a, it's nice to be working in a stable jurisdiction. Uh, I think that the second thing is that when you add the boron and the lithium that are both in the same mineralogy here, uh, it turns out by good, good, good fortune for us uh, that, uh, that when we extract from the rock, the lithium and boron really through the basically the same processing, uh, we end up with a huge amount of boron and boric acid that allows us to offset the, the overall cost of the project. And, and it turns out it makes the, the Rylai Ridge the lowest cost production on the earth at about $2,500 per ton for lithium chemicals. Well, we were talking uh, just before this interview, it was just important to be on the right side of the cost curve because um, I don't need to tell you, James, uh, lithium's had its ups and downs. It certainly has. And, uh, uh, you know, a year and a half ago, it was all bleak. Uh, I, I knew uh, from my experience and understanding of the markets that this was a temporary matter. There was a an early pulse of sort of the low hanging fruit that, and the supply side that came on, particularly out of Australia, uh, that uh, imbalanced the, the, the situation. And I also think that the other thing is on the demand side that we were, it was still slightly early in the uptick across the OEMs of the world. Uh, but this time it's really quite a fundamentally different situation than we had before. We're going to get into macro, but uh, let's just catch up with uh, mm. Ioneer. Um, I know that you have uh, some work uh, that you've been doing as a test pilot here out of my uh, locale in uh, Greater Vancouver. But uh, what's okay. the stage of Ioneer? Yeah, it's 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 by far the most advanced project in the United States. Uh, you know, we completed our definitive feasibility study with Fluor Corporation, one of the world's largest engineering firms, uh, almost a year and a half ago, and. No other lithium project in the United States has even completed the DFS, Definitive Feasibility Study. And we continued immediately after the DFS to a, a very full effort to get to final engineering. So at this point, we are highly advanced in our engineering. Our testing facilities ran beautifully. They were very full and, and, and complete. Uh, and so... Uh, we're we're really at the point where we're only waiting now for the final federal permit to build and we can start construction, particularly, of course, that we've just recently brought on our wonderful partner, Sabanye Stillwater, who uh, essentially well made it so that our, our capitalization is secure. So, uh, you know, the combination of great engineering being complete, all our testing operations complete, uh, all of our uh, years of work to prepare for the final permits complete our state permits we have. Uh, and really, we're waiting at this point to go through the NEPA process and the federal process, uh, which we expect to take, you know, another nine to 12 months. Uh, it's just a long process on federal lands. But other than that, we're ready to build. And, you know, it's, it's a project that's going to quadruple America's lithium production. So it's it's not trivial. It's enough lithium to support the production of about 400,000 electric cars a year for the next 25 years. So uh, the project is significant in its scale, it's significant in its importance in the United States, and it's very important for its supply chain stability and, and security. 
Uh, early this month, uh, the U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service proposed adding TM's buckwheat uh, to the endangered species list. Is there going right. to be an impact on rye light? You know, we've really, from from the very beginning, as soon as we got out there and we realized it, the teams is about 10 acres of this this low, kind of looks like a bush, a slow, low bush at first, but occasionally it flowers. Uh, it's, it covers about 10 acres only, and it's on the most western edge of our project. So we've known about it for from the very beginning. We've treated it very, very carefully. And we're, as a company, have been committed to developing all the understanding of the plant and very, very detailed understanding of how to make sure that our operations in Team Buckwheat can coexist. And look, uh, there's uh, we never one of the one of the challenges in the United States is that particularly when you're on federal lands, all and this is for all projects, is that there are a certain set of very activist uh, NGOs who whose mission in life and purpose is to stop development on federal lands, and they use whatever means is at their disposal to try to do that. And in our case, it's teams buckwheat. But look, other than that, there aren't any known issues that have been raised by anybody else. We think we've got a great handle on it. And I think that, look, uh, we have to make some, we'll have to, we've been making some adjustments, uh, but I think that those adjustments are very easily handled by our project. And we expect to get our approval uh, in the, the second half of next year. I'd like to switch to macro. Uh, look, there's a suite of metals in the battery metal space. You hear about your cobalts, your magnesiums, your copper, your graphites, and rare earth, which are all enjoying a lift due to energy transition. Mm -hmm. Where does lithium fit in vis-a-vis -vis the other metals? What's unique about it? Well, it's interesting. Uh, it, you know, when you start, you're essentially diving into battery chemistry, and uh, uh, there's different things that go into batteries, but I think there's a consensus, uh, there's a strong consensus that the one irreplaceable material in a, in a, a battery is a, a light, light duty battery, like we're talking about, you know, it can be light and can be used for mobile applications is lithium. Uh, no, no one's even suggested any replacement. Some people talk about, for instance, metal, lithium metal uh, batteries, solid state batteries of various types, but those all use more lithium. Uh, cobalt's different. There's a worldwide effort to work to try to reduce or, or eliminate uh, cobalt. Uh, so I think that it has a shorter uh, uh, period of, uh, of, of use. Uh, and, and the rest of them are important. But, but the, the, the really enabling material for these fancy batteries we use on cars and tablets and phones and other things, it really is lithium. So uh, I think that being in the lithium business is, is the most stable place you can be in the battery material space. There was a big run up in lithium prices in the last decade before the collapse. What's different this time around, James? Well, there's certainly one thing's common is that there's been a big run up in prices uh, as we had but once before. I think that the difference here uh, is that it's, uh, there, there's, there's such an explosion of serious uh, demand creation through every single OEM in the, in the, on the planet, you know, announcing enormous uh, investments uh, in uh, electric car manufacturing capabilities. And so the, 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 the feeling now is that it, the easy low hanging fruit was found before it's been all chewed up with the existing demand and the rate of growth of demand is so high and it's so broad uh, that that most people believe we have a, a fairly uh, uh, long period of high prices. Now, look, I don't know where the choke point is where you start pressing down on demand, but and maybe we're close to that. But but we're certainly in a band of price that is going to be pretty stable at a at a level that in in sense quality projects to be developed, like like Lyle Ridge. Uh, there's two companies, that you, or I should say rather, there's two countries you keep hearing about uh, regarding battery metals and uh, just uh, the development that has happened in it. And I just want to start first with China. And yes. we've talked about, uh, you've talked about uh, the, you know, that half a billion almost uh, that Sabanya Stillwater is putting in. But, um, right. you know, we've just seen huge numbers. We've seen uh, huge acquisitions uh, from Chinese companies just making big investments in the space. I, I saw some analysts talking about uh, that you're looking at 
a battery output of about two thirds just coming from China. Um, given all the capital that is required for this uh, and just uh, getting those kind of those scales, I just kind of wonder if China is really going to have the unrivaled scale. I mean, is it going to be a place where companies are going to end up sourcing most of their lithium ion batteries? Well, it's a great question, Michael, and, it, and it's something that policymakers around the world are struggling with because there's a there's certainly in the United States an overt and clear concern about over reliance on Chinese supply chains, and you're starting to see uh, significant action on the part of the OEMs in the United States to uh, be more careful about their sourcing. Uh, I, I think one of the groups that is the, one of the countries that isn't recognized sufficiently for its prowess is, is South Korea. I mean, the South Koreans are going to, in the case of the United States, are going to play an oversized role uh, in the supply chains for the American automobile companies. And then I think that in Europe, uh, uh, the Europeans are also very concerned about the exact same thing. And uh, you're seeing some strong efforts uh, by the Europeans to invest in European-based uh, cathode manufacturing as well as cell manufacturing. And you see this in companies, like, excellent companies like Nordvolt, uh, Umicor, BASF, and others are trying to significantly ramp up. And of course, part of this has to do with government's role. Uh, you know, the government has, governments have a role in all of this. They have to stimulate the demand. They have to help with some of the fundamental infrastructure. And I think that they're also starting to p pick up a role and say, look, you know, where we can provide prudent financing, we're going to do it to help stimulate the, 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 the outside China uh, influence. Uh, but there's no question, by the way, Michael, there is no question that the Chinese for the last 10 years have making heavy investments across the planet in securing supply, and they've built significant strength in their batteries and their cells and their everything that the whole, the whole shooting match. And I think that uh, they're going to be a formidable force. But I, I, I'm actually more optimistic right now than I have been. And I haven't been very optimistic, but I have kept becoming more optimistic that the Europeans, the Japanese, the Koreans, the United States are all going to play a pretty muscular role and not allow for a runaway by the Chinese. The other country, why is Australia such a major player in the lithium space? Well, it's got the it's got the world's best spodumene. It's you know that out there in the, the in the western part of the country, the, it, the mother nature blessed the country with uh, very uh, shallow tabular large spodumene, which you know produces. Sorry, you're going to have to just before you get too technical, James. Uh, help us out with uh, spodumene. Well, okay, uh, well, granitic lithium. rocks, granite type rocks that hold lithium is called spodumene. And it's, it's just the rock formation, that's what we call it. But the, the hard rocks in, in Western Australia uh, for lithium are particularly outstanding, the best in the world by a long shot. Uh, and the, and the, you know, the Australians have such a great mining culture, I mean, and capability. So they, they not only had the great rocks, but they have the know-how and the capabilities. And, uh, and I think the other thing, by the way, that is maybe less known about the importance in Australia is Australia is a very, has a very effective capital market. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very prudent and thoughtful capital market, but it, it supports the mining industry almost like no place else. And so they not only in the Australian based lithium, but in case like Oracobre, my, my former company that I was chairman of. Uh, you know, I mean, it's in South America, you know, they're, they're all over the place. And so uh, the, 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 they play an oversized role. I wish, of course, I wish that the Australians government would would become more proactive as it relates to the the uh, uh, climate change issue and and start being more supportive of the electric car revolution that's coming. Uh, but that's just a you know opinion of mine. <laughs> Uh, but uh, but but I, I admire the Australians enormously for what they've done. As I say, uh, we've just seen a real roller coaster ride with lithium, uh, just that was so beaten up uh, during the pandemic, and now you're seeing just this flurry of M and A deals. You see automakers are finally getting involved. Uh, James, uh, you've been in this for a while. Is there any major industry trend that you've noticed or you're keeping your eye on? 
I, of course, uh, you know, I have been uh, actively daily involved with it for 14 years, which is, makes me one of the old, old, old people in the industry. Um, the, I think the thing that, that I'm most focused on right now is how uh, OEMs, the big automobile companies around the world, are no longer taking a passive position of saying, well, we're just going to get our our batteries from X company. They're, 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 that's not enough for them anymore. And so I think across the world, we're seeing thoughtful leaders in the OEMs. Like, for instance, a great example of this is the leader of Ford, you know, who flat out came out and was very explicit the other day about it. I, so I admire that his, his courage to speak up about the full supply chain. So I think now what's happening is the, the, the guys that are actually in the end, the users, okay, They've said, we're, we're not going to let laissez-faire, you know, supply chains that just happen by, magically by price uh, rule the day. They, there's too much at stake. And now that they're making many billions of dollars in business, they want to know from end to end how they're going to get their materials, how they're going to get their cathodes, how they're going to get their cells, how they're going to make their packs, how they're going to put them in the cars. It's really the way it's going to be. Now, I don't think they're going to own that whole supply chain, but they're going to have a structured supply chain, and it's going to be close to the markets that they are in the markets that they serve. This is a huge uh, initiative across the globe. And also, of course, the continued importance of uh, uh, the environmental integrity of how these materials are made. So I think that those are the two big things, but I say the supply chain is the, the one that's caught my strong attention over the last couple of years. James Calloway, thanks for speaking with Kitco. It's great to be with you. Thank you for having me. He's James Calloway, Executive Chairman of Bioneer. My name is Michael McRae, and you are watching Kitco Mining. Kitco News, special coverage of the Explore Convention, is brought to you by Radisson Mining. <laughs>